Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have an idea episode and we're going to be talking about how you establish a partnership between safety and security. So it's going to be very fun. I'm excited to have with me Mr. Richie Fortenberry, who is a consulting engineer and operations manager at Prism Systems. So welcome, Richie. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm good. Now, where are you located at? I'm in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, our home office is in Mobile, Alabama. Okay. We have... We have uh, we have some people in in Orlando and um, in uh, Glendale area, California, and a few in uh, Detroit area. Uh, but my office is the Birmingham area. Okay, well, great. I love that Alabama. I'm sure, the summertime can get kind of tough, but that we'll save that for another conversation, man. Yeah. <laughs> How about get us going, man? Talking about safety and security, we have a lot of listeners out there who may not be familiar with what we're talking about for this particular episode. So get them up to speed work from an industrial standpoint. What are you referring to here? So, so let's start by contextualizing those terms of safety and security. Yeah, those words can be used as a, as a characteristic of a system. Like when we say is a system safe or is a system secure, we're talking about characteristics of that system. Um, but in the context I, I'd like to approach it today, uh, at least initially, I think it's helpful to think of those terms as, uh, as describing processes. Um, what steps and methodologies lead to a system being quantifiably safe or secure. So these are the, the processes of safety and security. Uh, so let's talk about safety first. That's, that's, uh, that's probably the more widely understood of the two topics in industry. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about safety in the context of control systems, I'm talking about the process of making a system safe, starting with uh, identification and initial assessment of hazards and failure modes, assessing the impact of those hazards and failure modes if they were to be realized, uh, determining any and applying any mitigations that you might come up with, reassessing the system once everything is mitigated, and ultimately implementing those mitigations as design changes or operational or maintenance procedures or uh, actual control system mitigations. And that's an oversimplification of the safety life cycle, but uh, let's leave it at that. But um, so if, if this process of safety is successfully executed, then the characteristic of safety uh, can be applied to that system. Um, so think process over characteristic in this, this conversation. Now on to security. Um, security of control systems and OT networks is a similar process to safety in a lot of ways. Um, it, and, and it's similar, you know, actually to securing IT systems and networks uh, or cybersecurity uh, principles more broadly. You know, the same malware that affects IT systems can also bring down an OT system. Um, many modern control communication protocols are built on top of the same protocols that are widely used uh, in IT applications. So they, they share the same implicit vulnerabilities. Um, but that said, we, we should be uh, careful about too closely relating IT and OT security uh, methodologies. OT networks play a bit by their own rules to a degree. IT security places comparatively higher emphasis on confidentiality and lower emphasis on availability. If you lose five seconds of availability in an office environment, it's likely that, that many users might not even notice. Um, you know, it's just a blip in, in their coverage. Uh, in a in a production environment, though, you know, loss of availability for five seconds could incur faults that bring the production line down, could cause waste waste of product, um, could incur further downtime and attempts to you know get the system restored back to operation. So OT communications are uh, are often uh, deterministic by necessity. You've got I/O devices and drives and such that are communicating back and forth with the controller. Um, that rely on deterministic communications and generate faults if uh, if there are lapses in coverage. Um, so there's a time sensitivity that drives availability as a key concern in OT environments. And uh, that's an important consideration in, in security. Um, there are also other sensitivities uh, in terms of security. Uh, you might go in to assess an OT network using your uh, typical tools or tool bag for for IT security assessment, and you could inadvertently bring an entire production system down. 
um, by using a port scan or something that's a, a common and relatively benign tool in other environments, but it's, it's, uh, it can be critical in the OT environment. Okay. Um, so OT security is related to IT security and cybersecurity more broadly, um, but it's, it's its own thing in a lot of ways and it merits being considered differently from those other forms of cybersecurity. But on the topic of, of safety and security taken together, you know, that there's a relationship between OT security and cybersecurity as a broad category should be pretty evident um, immediately. But what's not always evident or, or well understood in industry is that there's a, a strong relationship between um, security and safety in the OT environments as well. And that relationship, it, it's kind of been a soapbox for mine for a while. Uh, but, and sometimes it, it feels like uh, trying to convince people to leave a room that's actively burning or burning down around them. There, there's all the signs that you would need uh, to point towards and have been for a while uh, to point towards a greater emphasis on security and in industry. And uh, we've been pretty slow to adopt and, and to, uh, to respond to those obvious indicators. I mean, what do you think is the reason why, why the slow response there? I mean, because you definitely laid out some good, you know, points here to consider from a safety and security standpoint. Why, why the slow response? Um, I, I think it's, it's a little bit of complacency um, and a little bit of a false sense of security based on some insulating factors that we've benefited from uh, in, in the OT environment, um, you know, serialized protocols and things like that, that were, that are not popular elsewhere, uh, had ran our plants for a long time, but now that we're, we're kind of jumping on the, the, uh, the TCP IP train within in a lot of our protocols where we've become more exposed. Um, so you, we have still a little bit of the, of the idea of, you know, cybersecurity is not really a thing for most uh, production facilities. Um, there's that, there's some remnants of that mentality that have been unfortunately hard to root out. Right. Right. Well, I mean, thank you for what you've walked us through. There was a lot definitely to, to help understand the, the tie between safety and security, maybe help us understand a little bit more about the alignment between those two specific to the industrial environment. Cause I know that's what we're trying to focus on with you, Richie. So where, where do you see that, that tight alignment being? So the alignment between safety and security. So when we're talking about mitigating and responding to hazards in a control system uh, on a safety, on the, in a safety context, uh, we're dealing with safety functions on the software side that that rely on safety rated hardware and, or particular hardware architectures to be effective. The, the safety rating of a piece of hardware or the acceptable architecture that that uh, that drives a particular safety function. Uh, th these are defined by uh, a number of in industry specifications. Uh, ISO 13849 is a popular safety standard. Um, IEC 62061 is another. Those are where we get uh, performance level and SIL ratings, respectively. Okay. Uh, there, and there's also a level of interoperability between those standards and others. Um, mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily have to live in one all the time. Um, so we can design these safety systems. We can design them well by applying these uh, these specifications and standards and determining our appetite for risk and uh, applying appropriate mitigations. And we can ultimately quantify how well we're doing in terms of safety using these standards. Uh, but what we need to understand uh, and, and that I don't feel is often understood is that these mitigations and these uh, standards and these quantified results uh, that we get back from them, they're all set against the backdrop of things that control systems and relevant safety standards understand. Uh, so we're talking, we're living in at that point in the world and in the context of what, what PLCs and drives and, um, and these standards anticipate and can understand. Uh, so we tell these control devices about our world and the things that can go bad in it. And we tell them how to mitigate those things. And then they just, they go off and do their job. Mm -hmm. But it's a mistake to place ourselves too firmly uh, mentally within the constraints of the world of the control system and these standards you know that world is just a loose approximation of, of our real world you know the world in which we like to keep our bodies 
our lives intact. Um, yeah. You know, so, so there are things going on in the real world that affect functional safety and live outside of the understanding of PLCs and safety standards and such. And security is chief among those. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you're, if your system is not secure, it is not safe. It, it doesn't matter how many things you've checked off in your safety checklist. A, a failure to secure is a safety liability. So we really should be viewing the topics of safety and security as, as being strongly tied together. For sure. I mean, and that, that point to failure to sec secure as a safety uh, liability, that's it. I mean, I, th I love your passion around this topic. And I know we were talking, you know, getting our notes together, talking about where we're going, we would like to go. You mentioned a demo. And I think this is a great opportunity to, to bring that up here. And the demo that you built exposes a lot of these areas and those risks and those liabilities. And I think you were focusing on the safety PLC. So maybe can you give us walk through what that demo is and, and how you've used that to educate others uh, around this topic? Yeah, uh, it, there's nothing groundbreaking about the demo. But what I, I wanted to demonstrate how safety can be dependent on security in a simple and approachable way. I just thought, you know, it'd be helpful to demonstrate for our customers and others. You can you can talk and talk and talk about a concept, but um, sometimes it's better to just simply demonstrate that concept in a way that's immediately relatable. Uh -huh. So I built a small panel with a safety PLC inside and some safety IO uh, driving four pair of, of red and green indicators arranged in the panel door to look like traffic lights at a four way intersection. I didn't use a yellow one because I was cheap, and uh, but so but I had it set up where you could look at the front of the panel, panel and immediately recognize what was going on there. Okay. Then I wrote a simple PLC uh, program in the safety task uh, that would turn the lights from red to green to red to green in a manner that would simulate uh, a four-way traffic light, and everything was implemented. Uh, using a standards-based uh, approach to safety, uh, using best practices, using safety rated hardware. Uh, so, so checking all the safety boxes. Then I wrote a piece of malware, maybe a hundred lines of C code um, using readily accessible libraries that anyone could pull down from the internet to uh, snoop on, on network traffic and to, to spoof certain network protocols. Mm -hmm. The, the malware was capable of scanning an, uh, a network, um, identifying some of the control, uh, pieces of control hardware, communicating using a specific protocol, and uh, specifically attacking the relationship between the PLC and the remote IO. And again, this is a safety PLC, and yeah. these, are sa these are safety rated uh, remote IO. Uh, but it would attack it to the effect that it, it, could, um, it could modify and uh, kind of uh, take control over the producer in that relationship and turn all the lights green at the same time. Uh, so when I would do this uh, in the context of the of safety as the control system understands it, all the safety functions were still intact. Uh, There's nothing was broken there. Um, but in the context of, of the real world, a uh, very hazardous situation, a very, you know, a catastrophic situation occurred, loss of lives, uh, would be potential in this situation. We need to be thinking about safety in the real world and not only in the context of the control system. We're, we're bringing ourselves down a level by uh, being exclusive to the things that the standards and the, um, and the safety processors point to because they're, they are not in and of themselves uh, security devices. Um, so the, the control systems version of safety is an approximation of our own. It's not a direct replica. And we need to account for hazards that lie outside of that approximation. And this can't be done without considering security. So again, it's, if a system's not secure, it can't be called safe. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious on when, as you've shown that demo to others, what feedback have you gotten? Have you, are you getting a lot of these aha or you gotta be kidding me moments from, from people they just, they can't believe it. Yeah. I've had, uh, you know, d depending on the role of the people that I've showed it to, um, you know, if I've had some very uh, technical people say, "Hey, let me, you know, let me see your C code. Let me, you know, be very interested in in the vulnerabilities of some of those protocols and and how difficult or easy it is to um, to to crack those." I, I presented this at a conference once and had a guy come up and 
asked me to open the panel because he wanted to he wanted to verify that I am actually using <laughs> the things that I say that I'm using inside the panel. Um, so uh, and you know I, he, he was a sharp guy. I, I talked with him a lot afterwards. And but his what what drove his suspicion is uh, the idea that it it can't be that it can't be that that easy or that that exposed and yeah it really is um so yeah i mean the responses have been varied but you know then all the way up to you know management types that it's just kind of an eyebrow raiser and a recognition that hey you know we use this this stuff these these very same pieces of hardware for critical applications and we've taken some things for granted that that um that potentially we should not have yeah. Well, I mean, hats off to you for being innovative and, and actually bringing that real world visualization to life to, to show safety, security, the, the vulnerabilities that exist. I mean, so if you, if somebody's out there listening right now, Richie, and, they, and, and you maybe you have their hair standing up on the back of their neck a little bit, they're a little worried about what their risk profile may be. What steps should they take to, to start understanding that? So there's a number of standards out there that that provide a roadmap for for OT security programs and methodologies. Uh, I'm, I'm certified in ISA 62443. Uh, others that I know that are, you know, equally or more proficient even um, prefer NIST 882 as a as a starting point. Uh, those two aren't mutually exclusive. So like the safety standards, there's interoperability between security standards. Um, each will point you towards a defense in depth approach in most cases, which basically means that there are a lot of attack surfaces at different layers in your system and no one system is alike another. Um, so our, our defense strategy should be multi-layered as well, such that one failure, uh, to mitigate does not necessarily constitute a total failure of your security strategy. Um, and each of these standards will also take you through a process of assessing uh, what do you have, where would you like to go with your system. There are things that you should always do, like identifying and training stakeholders, taking inventory of your networks and devices, developing clear policy, communicating that policy well, uh, usage of more practical things like usage of uh, DMZs between OT and IT networks, those type of things that take you through your security lifecycle. There's also a good deal of flexibility though in how you apply uh, certain controls represented in these standards. You don't have to, to mitigate every conceivable event. You don't have to apply every single control that's, uh, that's available to you. In fact, you, you probably shouldn't. Um, you, have to, you may have a PLC on the backside of your facility that has very little impact if it's attacked in isolation. And it's, in, the, in those cases, it's perfectly fine to say, you let them have it if they want it. You know, if there's if that's where your appetite for risk is as a business, uh, you, so you you have to take these standards, digest them, and, and understand them well enough um, to apply them and evaluate them against um, your appetite for risk and and uh, your uh, your business case for having uh, security or not having security uh, tied to a certain device or process or area. So with that flexibility, then. Uh, there come a lot of questions that inform decisions like uh, what do we mitigate and how how do we design networks uh, to suit our particular need while uh, also being uh, also considering security uh, what should we be backing up how should we back up how often should we back up how how should you manage security patches on machinery that have, have high availability requirements how do we supply or apply security heavily enough to be useful, but lightly enough as to not stifle support or production? Because if you're if you're overbearing with your security policies um, such that it affects production and affects support, then people start looking for ways around it. Right. Uh, Try to break the system. Yeah, and 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 people find ways. Uh, you might have a you know an excellent badging system that is stifling to people who want to run machinery and invariably invariably it'll come down to someone sharing badges and just to keep the, the line running because you know the the thing that is most in people's faces is production and numbers and things like that um so you want to you want to you want to moderate your security in a way that isn't stifling to those people um and and communicate the importance of the measures that that do exist 
um, so that everybody has a common understanding of their role in, in, in terms of, of security. And so these type of topics and this type of uh, answering these questions, you know, you might benefit from consulting a company that has hands-on experience in securing these systems in a practical and reasonable way. Prism Systems, for whom I work, um, we were one of those companies that has proficiency in the OT space. Um, and there are others. Uh, there are also knowledgeable people working at uh, uh, the manufacturers of the, you know, the major manufacturers for controls products that can offer general guidance and security as well as uh, uh, guidance specific to securing uh, their own devices. Right. And that, that was really, you, you took me right to where I was going to go is, okay, we're, you know, I'm, I may be in a plant and I don't have that, that personnel who has the understanding like, like you do, obviously all around these topics, but I want to get there. So is it really, cons you know, teaming up with a consultant like yourself, or like you said, the manufacturer partners that s build these systems, that's a really good step you recommend? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, I think you can apply the same uh, concept as behind defense in depth um mm -hmm. you know don't limit yourself to a certain layer you know read the standards yourself um try to understand them at least conversationally um and yes uh you know if it's a if you find yourself uh you know struggling with or, or questioning uh some of the decisions that are being made about security policy you should always reach out to someone who's done it before right. uh, that's not that's not different from any other discipline in life um and 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 do lean on the the, the experts that um you know there, there's a lot of attention going towards industrial cyber cyber security um and that's no better reflected than what you'll find at uh you know the major manufacturers they're they're thinking about these things they have they, they have talented and smart people who are who are interrogating security of their own devices and and uh, can certainly be helpful there no doubt you know, and, and no, sometimes the industrial environment just has a different mindset. So in, any uh, misconceptions out there around safety and security that you like to just expose or talk about, you know, you, you mentioned several already, but just, any, just, just curious, is there anything that's missing from, uh, from the industrial standpoint you like to talk about there? So aside from the notion of of uh, safety as existing entirely separate from security that we've we've already talked about, um, I think uh, security. I'll call. It, I've heard the term and I like it. Uh, security by optimism. Okay. Um, it, it's a it's a well represented misconception in industry, and, and what I mean by that is that you hear concepts and, and comments like, um, "Why would anybody target our facility?" Well. If you're making widgets for some, you know, niche industry or something like that, you might be 100% correct in your optimism that you're not ever going to be targeted. Mm -hmm. uh, you might not be correct. Uh, it's it's hard to to get into the minds of some of these people who who execute these attacks. Uh, and the fact is, we have increasingly accessible attack toolkits uh, that remove most of the demand for technical ability on the part of the attackers. There are YouTube videos and tutorials that could take a fairly non-technical person through all of the steps required to use these readily available attack tools that can be just downloaded by anyone. Um, and you know, the idea of a hacker is uh, is stylized in our entertainment. And there are people who will execute attacks just for the image of it, um, you know, just to feel cool about it. Uh, but most facilities. Uh, who think that they won't be a target of a sophisticated or a state-sponsored group are, are probably correct. Um, and this is obviously not true for critical infrastructure and things like that. But, um, but like we said before, the um, many, many attacks that affect the OT system, um, they're sheer, uh, it's, it's a result of these common protocols and, and they're, it's really just collateral attacks, collateral damage. Nobody targeted a specific facility. You do have targeted facilities, but, um, uh, but a lot of these attacks are just incidental. Um, an infected computer got plugged into the network somewhere to troubleshoot some problem. And then, uh, weeks later, the system starts acting funny and we start using, losing resources and the system goes down now. So, whether or not a facility would be targeted or is likely to be targeted is a bit of a, of a straw man then. 
um, the degree to which you're exposed and the level at which you're prepared to defend and detect and remediate cybersecurity events, uh, those are more useful metrics. They're more useful than uh, when discussing security than a metric like such as the probability of a targeted attack, um, because exposure does not, it doesn't depend on whether you're targeted or not. It's just a thing that happens. Um, so you also hear comments like, well, we've been fine thus far. Uh, this is, and this goes back to you know my my comment on why are we still fighting this in industry and what it's the you know the root of the complacency and and the and the sluggishness to adapt in industry. So it's you hear comments like you know we've been fine so so far. Why prioritize security now? And this is again an, an overly optimistic approach. Um, those who are involved in designing safety systems should see an analog here. You know, in, in safety, it's often said. Uh, just because a hazardous event hasn't happened yet doesn't mean that it won't happen over the life cycle of, of a system. Mm -hmm. So there's a similar process and a similar view uh, uh, between safety and security. Um, the, the problem is a lot of places still aren't taking the security side of things seriously enough to do an earnest risk assessment within the context of security. So we should approach the two topics with similar respect. And, and I'll say again, if a system's not secure, it isn't safe. So if we're serious about safety, uh, we need to be more serious and more earnest about our, um, our assessment and our, uh, and our treatment of, of security issues. No doubt. I, I love it. There are so many things you unpacked there that around common misconceptions and Richie, yeah, you're, Definitely. You're such an expert in this. I, I can't thank you enough for what you've shared with our listeners today. Uh, very enlightening for me. I know I just sat back there, a lot of listening, but took a lot of notes, maybe tied together the why. We always wrap up with the why on Eco Ask Why. You know, so what would be, you know, why is having that clear understanding of safety and security so important for those industrial end users out there? Well, we're, we're hearing more and more about attacks on control systems. And it's not that we're any worse at securing these control systems today than we used to be. Um, and it's only partially due to the fact that attackers are, are more aware of control systems and more inspired to attack them as, as targets. Um, but we, we've been passively protected in the past by the protocols like ViceNet, Modbus, Profibus, those type of protocols that aren't built um, on the TCP IP backbone and are thus kind of out, outside of the toolkit and the comfort level of, of most attackers. Now OT communications are moving more and more onto TCP IP based protocols. Uh, these protocols have vulnerabilities that are well known to attackers who are specifically targeting systems. Um, and there are toolkits built around these specific vulnerabilities. So aside from the targeted attacks and probably more dangerous, uh, widespread usage of these protocols in the OT environment expands the window by which these non-targeted attacks might make their way onto our OT network. Right. Um, and a, a, you know, a big example and, a, and a, a, a topical example would be uh, ransomware attacks. Um, so ransomware attacks uh, are, are designed to be highly infectious uh, and they're not typically rigorously targeted attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, the business model of a ransomware attack is the more devices I affect with my attack, the more profitable that becomes for me. So I need to write this thing such that it infects everything. So you're looking for widespread coverage of your attack. Uh, and there are other, other things incentivizing ransomware attacks. And they, if you're already in the system, why not trigger a ransomware attack? Uh, it's, it's another way to monetize uh, your, uh, your ill intent. So, but because there are these highly infectious uh, wide coverage pieces of malware out there, um, Many OT cybersecurity incidents are not actually targeted attacks, uh, but they're one of these more general, highly infectious attacks that make their way onto a, an OT network and then cause a ton of collateral damage. This is all made possible, and I've referenced it before, about uh, due to the widespread adoption and usage of TCP IP based protocols. Uh, all of that said, I'm, I'm not ab advocating for abandoning these protocols at all. Um, they are, they're very useful. They're easy to work with. Uh, the, the, uh, they offer a wider opportunity for connectivity, uh, which is a good thing if treated correctly. Um, these are all good things. We just need to, to be better about how we design and secure our OT networks 
Um, we can't rely on security by optimism or security by obscurity um, any longer uh, because we're now moving into these areas where we're operating on 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 well-known grounds. For sure. For sure. Well, Richie, this is, again, so much wonderful information. For the listeners out there that want to learn more, maybe even see that demo, check out the show notes. We'll, uh, we'll have the information to get connected with Richie directly uh, to ask questions. And, and thank you so much for all the information you shared. So it was a, a scary topic, to be honest. I mean, when you really sit back and think about it. But if you take the good approach like you've really laid out for our listeners here, uh, we can all be more safe and more secure. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit EcoSY.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y dot com.